everyone! My name is Evie Lupine. Welcome back to my channel and today I have another video for you all. Today we have a ton of updates to actually several of the stories that we have been following. Everything from the Marilyn Manson allegations over to Army Hammer and also the BDSM cult in Australia. It's a lot of stuff to get through. It's several smaller stories, so not really anything that I could do like individual videos on, but things that I think are worth sharing and talking about. So let's go ahead and get into it. The first two big updates I have are both related to the Marilyn Manson allegations. Probably the one that is the biggest is actually Ashley Morgan Smithline, previously known to us as Ashley Lindsay Morgan, did an entire spread with People Magazine talking in more detail about her relationship with Marilyn Manson. And just to remind everyone, if you missed the content warning at the beginning of this video, this is quite intense, so please keep that in mind as we go into this story. His abuse started while filming. The first time he hit her, she says he whipped her bare as she lay face down and naked on his bed. With the windows blacked out, Manson would lie to her about the time of day and force her to continue working into the early hours of the morning. Then, she says, the physical abuse became sexual. The first time she says he raped her, she woke up in the morning screaming, realizing her arms were bound. Manson had been penetrating her while she slept. He kept telling me, you can't rape someone that you're in love with. As part of this spread with People Magazine, she actually did a full video interview, which I will link down below, that is really worth watching in full. She also notes that while in the relationship with Manson, she dwindled down to below 80 pounds, to the point that you could actually fully see her ribs. Manson would actually take advantage of this while he was performing acts against Ashley. He reportedly carved into where her ribs were jutting out against her skin as well as into her thigh. Also, allegedly, carving his initials into her thigh. These are actually plainly visible in some of the photos that she did with People Magazine. He also allegedly made her participate in a blood pact, which is not the first time that we've heard about this from Manson. She was locked so frequently in the bad girl's room that she lost track of how many times that she was in there. The longest that she reports that she remembers being locked in there was over six hours, and due to his habitual alcohol and drug use, he would oftentimes forget that she was locked in there for extended periods. And he was very arbitrary, reportedly one of the reasons that she would be locked in the bad girl's room was because she needed to pee while being forced to listen to his music on repeat. And Manson didn't want to lose her as part of his forced audience, so instead she would be locked in the bad girl's room as punishment. One of the objects that he allegedly would use on her was apparently a Nazi whip. Again, we are seeing more and more themes as we get more details in these stories that really seem to all link up, whether that be the bad girl's room or, in this case, the Nazi memorabilia. For me, I think the part of this interview that really stuck out was when she said that even when he was abusive sometimes, he would be joking and funny, and then other times he was the most terrifying monster, reminding her that he could kill her and that she was literally disposable. I think this does a great job of outlining how abuse can be such a complex situation. I think many people have this idea that abusers are just outright obviously evil at all times, when in reality it can easily be covered up with laughter and jokes. Also, during this video interview, she responds to the accusations that she knowingly entered into a BDSM relationship. I didn't know what BDSM was, and a lot of people are like, you knowingly entered into a BDSM relationship. Like, I don't know what that is now, even. And I've seen like 50 Shades of Grey. Like, I don't, like, I don't 
I don't, I didn't know what that was then. And that wasn't what he presented at all. Like he didn't say like, we're gonna have a relationship where you're gonna kneel down or lay on the bed and I'm gonna whip you with a swastika whip or I'm gonna cut you while we're having sex or, um, We're gonna have a blood pack. I'm gonna drink your blood, you're gonna drink mine. I didn't know, like, I mean, obviously I knew that was weird, but there was something, like I was already taken. I was already there. And I don't know about you guys, but I get the sense just from the way that she pronounces BDSM and the way that she talks about it, that she appears to not have genuinely known at the time and still doesn't really know exactly what BDSM is. And from my perspective, it does seem that it would have been unlikely that she knowingly entered into a BDSM relationship with Manson and that everything that they did was really just consensual BDSM. And on a final note to this story, Smithline and Esme Bianco's lawyer, Jay Elwanger, also made a statement to People Magazine in support of his client. Quote, I am proud to represent Miss Smithline as she comes forward to share her truth about Brian Warner. We are exploring all options to hold him accountable for his actions and to make sure that his behavior ends once and for all. And speaking of Esme Bianco, that is the other big news item that we have to discuss with the Marilyn Manson allegations. As around the end of April, it was revealed that Esme Bianco was in fact pursuing legal action against Brian Warner, aka Marilyn Manson, in the form of a lawsuit. While the facts of the case do seem to closely mirror what we already knew from public statements that she had met Manson around 2005 through his then fiance, that she was then flown to LA around 2009 for a video project that never ended up happening, and that their relationship had a violent end in 2011, there are still some particular details from the court documents that I think are really interesting that reveal things we didn't previously know about the relationship between Esme Bianco and Brian Warner. This includes the fact that during a visit in 2009, Manson forced her to sit at his feet during press visits and verbally degraded her during interviews. He also attempted to bring a minor back to the hotel room he shared with Bianco at the time. When they had a relationship together in 2011, he would be verbally abusive towards her if she could not find objects that he had hidden around the apartment or if she objected to the violent and sexually graphic films he played, in addition to other instances of verbal abuse that we already knew about. Also, the knife that he allegedly used on Esme Bianco was, say with me everyone, a Nazi knife. This guy definitely seems to have a pattern with his Nazi memorabilia collection. Also, allegedly when she attended one of his shows, she was forcibly kissed by him and he only stopped when one of her friends intervened. Now, the causes in this suit contain three separate elements, sexual assault, sexual battery, and the Trafficking Victims Protection Reauthorization Act. It's kind of a mouthful. I think I said that correctly, but if I didn't, I'll also put the full name of the act on screen. Now, I'm not a lawyer, so I can't speak to the merit of these claims or how closely they actually hew to the letter of the law, so I can only really report on what is just strictly said in the paperwork, and I really, really hope that a legal channel on YouTube, somebody maybe like Emily D. Baker, does look at these court filings as we get responses and additional information especially considering the fact that one of the biggest issues with this whole situation has been people saying, well, if this stuff really happened, 
why hasn't there been legal action? And now that legal action is actually taking place, I think it's gonna be really important to really follow what happens over the coming weeks, months, possibly even years, because these things do oftentimes take such a long time to get through. And knowing that, I really, really applaud Esme and maybe Smithline in the future because they are working with the same lawyer for speaking out not only in public, but also choosing to go through this court process because it is grueling and emotional and again, takes such a long time. And I just have so, so much respect for her strength for choosing to engage in this justice process. And those are the two updates that we have to the Marilyn Manson story. Now next, we have a short update on the Army Hammer situation. Things have been quiet really with that case since the last time that we discussed it when Effie, one of Army Hammer's accusers, did a press conference. As far as I can tell, there hasn't really been anything further, legally speaking, that has happened, but Army Hammer's aunt, Casey Hammer, has actually been making some moves behind the scenes. As of late April, Casey Hammer is supposedly working on a docu-series about the Hammer family with a company known as Talos Films. Quote, this series will tell the definitive inside story of the rise and fall of the notorious Hammer family, including its latest unfolding chapter. Talos is currently shopping the project with broadcasters and streaming services. And supposedly this is going to be the first time on film that Casey Hammer is telling her full story. She is giving access for the first time into her personal archives and new revelations providing a compelling first-hand account into the Hammer family's rise and fall and her own descent into and escape from the darkness. Most notably, they said, quote, the series will also feature accounts from other survivors who have recently come forward. And that is really interesting because the implication with that is that this is not going to just be Casey Hammer's story, but is really gonna focus on Army Hammer and possibly some additional accusers besides just Effie. Casey Hammer has actually previously shared some of her experience being a member of the Hammer family. She actually already has a book out where she talks about some things. And so it sounds like maybe she's gonna be going into even more detail than she did at the time in that book. And she has been actually estranged from her family for quite a long time. She actually works at Home Depot. And it will be interesting to see how maybe this explains the context of Army Hammer, maybe a little bit about his upbringing, what led him to this point in his life. However, the worry that I have is documentary creators don't always have the best intentions. And it's really easy to try and give your full story, give everything as honestly as possible, and then have the documentary be cut in a way that you don't really have control over and creating a narrative that you never really intended to exist in the first place. The last update that I have for you all is from our BDSM cult case in Australia. It has been a little while since we have had any updates about that, at least to my knowledge. The last update that we had was in regards to his bail hearing because he was arrested on slavery charges. But now it seems that Australian police are also looking into several of James Robert Davis's associates. And Australian news outlet Nine Now or A Current Affair, I'm not sure which one is actually like the outlet or the show, but in any case, an Australian news company actually did a piece of investigative journalism on two of those associates, David Taylor and Joshua Clinch. The actual recording of this piece was only on air in Australia for a very limited amount of time, but I did manage to find a cell phone recording of the piece as well as a print article that went alongside of it. 
in regards to Taylor, people have come out to accuse him of a variety of non-consensual acts, such as using hypnosis to get people into a state where he could manipulate their consents, specifically pursuing and targeting young, inexperienced women in the BDSM community, and using a cattle prod on people without their knowledge or their consent. But Jasmine's romantic journey with Taylor took a disturbing turn. And I felt as though he was using me to a very large extent to lure other women into the situation. So Jasmine says her rope play with Taylor, in her mind, became abusive. I said to him, why are you doing this? And he said, because I want to show you that you belong to me. Jasmine alleges Taylor's mind games included hypnosis, which posed a far greater danger to women. To have them in a state where they were not able to consent, in a hypnotic state, um, and that included sexual things, that included being touched, that included being tied, that included being passed around to other people. Other women allege Taylor used an electric kettle prod on people without their consent. Beck is a single mum and travel agent. She saw Taylor shock unsuspecting adults. And they definitely did not consent to being cattle parted. What about the use of a cattle prod? Have you ever used that? I've used all kinds of different toys, but I've only used them with consent. But Taylor makes these admissions in an online message. I had a small handheld cattle prod. I zapped her. Not appropriate behaviour. I apologise unreservedly. Now, I don't know this for sure, but... I think this is a rigor known as Hibari, and this was a rigor that was also an educator. They were primarily based in Australia, but I do know that they did also travel to some US-based events, I think like BED, for example, in Texas, and God, this is just, this is another example of how the Shibari rigor community is just in so many ways like rotten to the absolute core with abusers. It is absolutely mind-blowing how many people in the world of Shibari every year are accused of credible consent violation allegations. And just to speak in particular to some of the allegations here, using a cattle prod on somebody is not the same as like using a violet wand on a gentle setting. That is a very extreme form of electroplay and the idea that a bondage educator would use that on somebody without their knowledge or permission is just, oh god, it just, it makes me really angry because like you don't know what somebody's medical conditions are and when it comes to electroplay like you are messing with a lot of things there like what if somebody had a pacemaker and you use this on them without their knowledge like what are you doing <laughs> i just i i cannot imagine the thought process there like did you just think it was funny and Going back to the earlier note about hypnosis, like hypnosis is controversial. Not everybody believes that it works. Some people think that it is just a placebo effect, but I have talked on this channel before with hypnosis. I've actually had a really detailed conversation, which I will link down below, where we did discuss sort of the consent, important frameworks around how to do hypnosis in an ethical way and using hypnosis as a way to manipulate people's consent is absolutely not allowed and not a good thing to be doing. And he even admitted in text messages that he didn't really understand what he was doing. And the second person that a current affair attempted to speak with is known as Josh Clinch. And he was allegedly one of Davis's right-hand people and he was in fact mentored by him in that particular style of domination which as we can tell from this overall story is kind of a problematic thing to be involved with. 
Supposedly, he had partners that were too terrified to leave him because of the amount of power and control he had over their well-being and their lives. And while he did not give any information to journalists when they approached him, he does appear to, like, break down crying when they do approach him and, like, attempt to cover his face. And I don't know what that means, but that is a pretty interesting reaction, whatever you take away from that. And I think the important thing to know about this story is A Current Affair did give over their investigative research to Australian police to allow them to look into these allegations more thoroughly, and so only time will tell if they are able to make a case based on these allegations and if there is any merit to them. But I think, again, you know, it's going to be really interesting to see how this intersects with allegations against Davis. Are they interconnected? Are they totally separate? I don't know. And, uh, you know, as much as I don't like to see it when there are more abusers unveiled in the kink community, I am really happy when legal action is taken against them so they can be held accountable to their bad behavior. I just really hope this doesn't end up going in the direction of BDSM itself, consensual BDSM, being legislated against in Australia. But again, only time will tell. Now, those are all the stories that I have to share with you all today. Hopefully you liked this. I like getting to do kind of shorter update videos to keep track of these stories because I know so oftentimes when YouTubers make videos about big flashy allegations, they don't really keep up with the little details that happen over time and then it's really easy for those things to get lost in the noise. So hopefully this kind of helps you stay up to date on these stories because it is a lot to get into. Now as one final thing, I do want to say that I am working on a formal part three to the Marilyn Manson allegations, you know, responding to some of the supposed evidence that these women are lying, other things that again, I haven't been able to cover in the previous, like what is it, two and a half, three hours of content I've made about that so far. So look out for that in the future. I have sort of enjoyed taking a break, getting more into just normal, BDSM content, but that is on the way when I feel mentally prepared to do so because I have the full thing outlined, scripted, ready to go. I just have to be in a place where I'm like ready to talk about all of that heavy stuff because uh, there's a lot of it that makes me <laughs> pretty damn angry. But on that note, again, that's everything that I have to share with you all today. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Hopefully you got something out of it. If you have not already, please do subscribe because I make videos twice a week about all sorts of BDSM and kink related things. If you enjoyed this, if you want to help support my channel, the best way that you can do that is by Patreon. That is what makes this channel possible as well as all of these videos, exclusive perks and rewards. We are currently trying to get to 1000 patrons and when that happens, I will be able to go into other types of content that I have not really been able to make before just because of the limitations of YouTube. So if you want to help me out reaching that goal, a link will be down below. If you already support me over there, thank you so, so much. It means the absolute world to me. And until I see you guys next time, I hope you have a great rest of your day and a great rest of your week. Bye-bye.